Hi everybody. Well, we really had to back the camera out for this one. It is a Halicrafters SX-71. And uh, my friend Ken brought it in uh, to have it done. He's been waiting a long time, so shout out to Kent, my buddy Ken. Uh, <laughs> we uh, see each other at all the football games and things, and he lives nearby and been around for a long time. So I promised him I would get to this eventually, and this year we're getting around to it. And uh, it's this is a little it's a little bit dirty, but the overall condition on it I think is going to be really good, and I think it's going to really clean up. Now I am not going to do anything to the main cabinet, but what I might do because there is a little more rust on it. Uh, one of the things we may do is strip this top cover down and just spray paint it silver again, just to stop that rust. The rest of it I think is very cleanable. I mean, it really doesn't look too bad. This was supposedly the first, correct me if I'm wrong everybody, if I understand correctly, this was the first dual conversion uh, receiver uh, ever, in production at least, ever made. So it's kind of a historical piece as well. Now this one is a run four. They did four different production runs of these. This was the fourth production run. And we can tell that because the knobs do not have the little silver inserts in them. And if you look at the band spread, there is actually a 15 meter scale on there. So if it has the 15 meter scale and it is not using the silver inserts inside the knobs, then that indicates this is a run four, at least as far as I understand. So we're going to have to just vacuum it out a little bit so we can get it out of the case. And we'll just kind of remove this thing from the case and uh, see what we have. Okay, I've got the case taken off of it. And we're just giving it its first little look. And it looks as if very, very little has ever been done in this. It's got all the original components in it. And let's really zoom in there for a second. And I want you to kind of look here for instance, on uh, the adjustments for the IF cans, you could see the paint has never been disrupted on it, on any of them. It's all original. But I only see one thing that appears to be, oh, has been uh, modified, and that's right here. And you can see where this wire has just been disconnected and is hanging. And then we have this other wire that's connected. And believe it or not, this has been added at some point in time. You can see where they soldered it to the case here and to the chassis right here. And then it's going right into this tube. And which tube is that? That is V, I believe that is V5, V4, V4 which is your first IF amp. So this is the first IF amplifier, and it goes on to pin one, two, three, pin four, and pin four is your input grid. And so what they're doing is they're tying on to the input grid of your first IF when it comes right out of the oscillator mixer section uh, and the converter. And then they're connecting it to this jack, which this was originally the phono input. So if you look back here, it says phono. I don't know if it's, it won't focus on us, but focus, phono. But what they did was they removed the phono input, which that's kind of naughty because if you select phono right now, it'll home pretty bad, I bet. And they connected this to basically your IF. So this is a, either an input or an out output, you know, like for a, uh, I don't know, maybe this is where they would connect, for instance, a uh, pan adapter or something like that. 
And you can see it was, it's was it been done a very long time ago because this is that old braided shielded wire and cloth covered. Other than that, I don't see anything else that's been done to this. It's all original components. Uh, very clean. Nothing looks uh, heat damaged or anything like that. So I don't even think this was really a super high hour unit. Looking at the RF alignment section, it looks just absolutely mint. I mean, it's perfect. And even like these wafer switches, if I zoom you in on them, take a look at those. Like right in here, see the little terminals? They're not even tarnished. I mean, they're completely clean and it doesn't look like they've been sprayed or anything like that. They're just extremely clean. So when I first got this thing, it was kind of cruddy on the outside, but you just, you can't judge a book by its cover, as they say. So this is going to be a really good uh, unit to restore. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. All right, we're going to do this scene a second time with the microphone turned on this time. <laughs> so, so far, all I've done is I removed all the tubes and... I replaced the very unsafe safety capacitor, this domino cap that was in there with a proper safety cap, and I replaced these two paper foil capacitors with proper mylar ones, and that's it. The other tubes are all pulled out. The only two that we have in right now is the 5Y3 rectifier there and the OD3 voltage regulator. We're just going to check and see if we can get power supply or have power on the power supply. I have a 40 watt bulb as a current limiter in circuit right now. And I had somebody ask me, I have the meter set up so we can get in scene here. I had somebody ask me, why don't you get a bench top meter and use that? And uh, I actually answered that I do actually have two bench meters right here on the bench for digital. These are Keithley 197 and a Keithley 2015, and I even have two analog meters, a RCA Voltomist and a uh, HP 410C. But the reason I don't use those a lot is it's much easier for me to use the handheld meters and uh, to get them in shot along with what we're working on so we can see everything. But I do use those other meters a lot when I'm just working on the bench not making a video which is not very often anymore because I really don't get much time beyond what you see <laughs> right here. So anyway, let's turn this thing on and see if we get power and see what happens. Here we go. Okay. And the dim bulb was really dim and then it lit up a little bit, which means that the 5Y3 warmed up and you can see we're getting voltage down here. The bulb is staying pretty consistent. That's good. And we have about 170 volts. And it's going to creep up slowly as the capacitor charges up through that bulb and as the tubes warm up and so forth. Let's look at the voltage regulator. And let's see if we get uh, if what we have for our regulated voltage. So let's go. That would be pin five. So one, two, three, four, five, right there. And that's right at 148 volts. And I believe that is supposed to regulate at 150. And it's sitting right on 148 right now. And I have no doubt that if we went up, you know, took the dim bulb out of there, it would sit right around 150 right on the money with a load on it. Okay, let's take a look at what happens when we switch over to a 110 watt current limiting bulb. All right, I'm going to go to first to the 5Y3 output, which is down here. And that power supply should be somewhere 
if it's 270 volts at this red lead right here, then this is going to be a little higher than that. But uh, and it doesn't really tell you anywhere what that should be, but it's it's going to be under 300 volts, somewhere around 300. And since there's no tubes in here anywhere, there's no load anywhere. So it's actually, this is all going to float high, or it should float a lot higher than 270 volts until you put the tubes back in and uh, draw some current. So let's turn this on and see what it gives us. And you can see, even with no tubes at all, we have 258 volts. We don't have 270. Our bulb is, to me, glowing brightly. Normally, a, a circuit like this with no tubes fitted and only the rectifier, that bulb would not even glow at all. And you can see we have about 342, I don't know if we can see it or not, 342 milliamps with 99 volts, with almost 100 volts. So we're not, you know, we're almost to full voltage. So this thing's drawing a lot of current. And the, the little, one little filament in there isn't really making that much difference, you know, if that 5 volt filament on that 5Y3 rectifier. So I want to show you something. Let's go over to here and let's look at the voltage regulator that's in there, that OD3 tube. And we, it's a 150 volt regulator, and you can see we have 150 volts, which is exactly spot on what it should be. So it's regulating. And this resistor up here is actually getting warm to the touch, pretty, actually uncomfortably warm <laughs> already. And remember, there is nothing connected to this tube. In other words, where it comes off the 150 volt line here and goes up, there's only a couple places in the IF section that use that regulated 150 volts. And none of them really have any directly connected uh, capacitors to ground. So it can't be a leaky capacitor because all of the resistors going into there are pretty high rating, you know. And there is this one capacitor here, but it's already been replaced, this 50 nanofarad. I replaced that already with a brand new Mylar film cap. So why is that resistor getting hot? Do we have something shorting to ground? All right, let's, let's just pull that tube out, that regulator tube. I'm going to shut it off. We're going to pull this voltage regulator tube out now. And I'm going to do nothing else. And I'm still connected to that resistor to the output, which is right here. I'm checking. So that's going to be on what your 150 volt line would be. Let's turn this back on. And you can see now the voltage is shot up to 320 some volts which is what we would expect because there's no load on there, right? So we've just proven that there is no load or no leaky components down in the radio. So why is that? Well, <laughs> these voltage regulators are power hogs. What they're going to do is they're going to take that whatever o voltage overage there is and short all but that 150 volts to ground. So you have over 100 and 180 volts that has to be dropped across this tube to make that 150 volts. So even with very low current, you know, just the current in the capacitors and the resistance of the circuitry and everything, it's going to consume a lot of energy. And that's what I'm saying. So there's really no shorts <laughs> in this receiver. It's just that's how, much, uh, that's how much energy this thing hogs up to give you that regulated 150 volts. And if you would put 
solid state Zener diodes in a whole string of them to, to give you 150 volts, you'd have the same thing. This resistor would still get hot and you would, because you have to drop that voltage somewhere, it has to go somewhere, that power has to go somewhere. So, and I, this is totally cold now, it's cooled way down. So the point that I'm making is that uh, you got to be careful when you're checking a power supply like this. Oh, and by the way, the bulb is not even lit now. It's not always shorted capacitors. It's not always you need to replace the filter caps. Sometimes you have to look at the circuit design to know what the problem is. That's all I'm trying to show you here. Okay, I have all the evacuated thermonic transconductive devices installed in the receiver. Let's turn it on and I will focus you over here as well. And let's see what we get. Okay. We're at about 435 milliamps at 80, 88 volts. And that's about what I would expect with that kind of load. The meter just drove. That's good. Very good. And I have absolutely bumpkiss for sound. Nothing. Not any hum. Not any crackling. Nothing. Now the fact that this meter has uh, driven all the way to zero tells me that at least the part of the radio is working in the IF section. But and I don't see any kind of, well, that's band spread. I'm connected to an antenna, so this should move. Of course, it's pegged right now, so that the pot in the back is probably rotated, and it needs to be set. But there is absolutely no sound whatsoever. Okay, I have the signal generator connected, and I am getting kind of a noise a little bit. So, I'm driving a really hard signal though. So let's take a look around here and see what we can do. Okay. second here. And I don't have any of the shields on the tubes either, so you're going to get some noise. So that 6BA6 socket, that 6BA6 socket seems to be causing a lot of our problems. And these are little dental cleaning things you can buy at the pharmacy or grocery store or wherever. And those, actually the socket pins feel tight. They all have a lot of tension on them. So that's good. The pins on the tube itself look pretty clean, but we'll make sure they're clean. We'll wipe them off. And let me go through and do all the rest of them. And We'll try it out again. Alright, tube sockets are cleaned. And tubes are put back in. Nice. 
Now, the one thing I did not clean is I did not clean the rotor on the uh, tuning gangs. So those will need to be cleaned up as well. But as you can hear, there we go. So that's good. It's working. Let's hook it up to an antenna and see if we can get any kind of stations. We got some problems still. Well, let's try cleaning that tuning rotor first before we do anything else. Okay, I'm going to use this stuff because it's a great big can and uh, it's the contact cleaner and lubricant all in one. It just use it's good for potentiometers, switches, tuners, electronic controls, etc. See the back panel, and they talk a lot about it on here. So if you want to read it. But the nicest thing about this is it's eight bucks for a big can of it. So, and I've used this in the past, it works really well. You can get it at Micro Center uh, computer stores, and you can, of course, get it at all the online places. So, good stuff. All right. Let's clean this off. And we're, we're, same thing as when we did the Sansui 7500 in the last video series. Just these little areas in here. And this is nice because it has like a silicone type lubricant that it'll leave behind, which is really nice. And it cleans everything real well. So we're just going to go right through here and go back and forth. Just give it a good cleaning. And if we have to take a little brush in there and kind of brush off the gross stuff, we will with a little bit of alcohol or something. And then I'll apply a little more of this stuff. But this should take care of it. OK, tuning gang is cleaned up. And let's see if it's all scratchy, crunchy now or if it uh, tunes a little better. And I'm now switched on to the 300 watt bulb and I'm drawing about 700 milliamps at 110 volts which is really good so the current limiter is not limiting a whole lot and, and again my test speaker is not high fidelity and it does have that limiting capacitor in it to protect it from DC <laughs> So we're not going to get the greatest sound on Earth, but we don't care about that. All right. Let's see. Band spread is set all the way over. Oh, there we go. And because the left... getting a whole lot down okay, here but mostly talk stuff on right now all right we've gone through and replaced the paper capacitors with nice mylar ones with some nice film capacitors and I've gone through and just kind of spot checked the resistors and things everything looks good haven't changed anything I was very meticulous about keeping the capacitors in the same position as the original ones not moving any uh, not rearranging the furniture anywhere. So let's turn this on and see just by doing those few things we've done so far if the radio is going to work. All right, we got this all cleaned up and we can see our little regulator tube glowing purple. And 
we still have rust a little bit and uh, without totally disassembling this and sandblasting it or something you'll never get it perfect so it is what it is but it cleaned up and I put some uh, protectant on it so that it doesn't uh, get any worse Faceplate cleaned up really nice, as did the glass on the dial. And the dial accuracy is a little bit out, but I'm on band number four right now. I just kind of turned this on and connected my 43-foot vertical antenna to it. And it's receiving everything. The only thing I, that I do notice is all of the channels, the, the uh, dial accuracy is off. Not a lot, but a little bit. So it could just be that the, the pointer is off more than the whole alignment. So we may just do a little testing and, and decide to just do that. But uh, the dual conversion, of course, comes into play in these top three bands. And you can hear it's working perfectly. And triggering an overreaction of the immune system. Thank you, scientists, for helping to discover the cause of MISC. So effective treatments can be made available. May the pandemic soon end. As and we're to become vegan, right now happen to be on band number four, which is the we're up on 20 meters somewhere, I believe. I'm not mistaken. So somewhere between the 15 and 20 meter band. Again, all this is not, the di dial accuracy is not dead on, so I'm not sure yet. We'll have to look at it. But it is playing. And of course, it's, it's daytime, so it's not night yet. And I still have the dim bulb in there a little bit, you can see, which I'm thinking we can switch out of now can probably go direct and that might give it a little more life. It really didn't make much difference. Something I wanted to mention, I removed the knobs to clean the faceplate and to clean the knobs themselves and for those of you who don't know, if you're going to work on these Halocrafters, these old ones, they don't use a hex key for the set screws in the knobs. It actually uses these little spline wrenches, and I want to show you the difference. So this is a 5 64ths Allen wrench, and this is a spline wrench of the same size, I believe. And you can see they actually have a different shape to them. Is that? Can you see it? Now, a lot of times, people will force this in there and it will distort these little splines and then you can't fit this anymore. And somebody has done this. They, had, they must have had the correct size spline wrench for the small, like for these knobs here. But for the crystal phasing knob and the band select knob, somebody shoved one of these in there and now you know, an Allen wrench will fit, but the proper spline wrench will not. So just so you guys know, don't try to force these in there. It will ruin these set screws and they'll strip out. You can buy these online. They're called spline wrenches. And here's a, what they look like. Or Bristol, they call them Bristol wrenches. And they just come in a little bag and you get a little kit of them like this. So you know, I, have, I have all mine in one little pack here. There's actually more than a set in there. But just something to remember. Just want you to hear, I hooked this up to a hi-fi speaker. Listen how good the sound is and I'm on the 20 meter band <laughs> just listening to a short wave station. I mean, for short wave, it's pretty nice. This thing is a nice little radio. 
And like I said, I've done nothing to it yet. Really, the only thing I've done to this was clean it, replace the capacitors, and, you know, those couple little things you saw me do. But I haven't touched the alignment. I haven't really done anything. That It's using all the original tubes. Everything's original. And this thing's... And, these are known to have problems with the upper bands, you know, with the uh, the dual conversion and with the uh, 4.5 megahertz uh, IF. But obviously on this one, we're not having that problem. So, yeah, I'm really pleased. As well as an area for people to connect with the blessing of nature. Scotland to prohibit single-use... Okay, we're going to check the alignment of this receiver. As I said, I think it's pretty close, and we may not have to touch very much, if anything. But I wanted to go over with this, or with you, the procedure, because I have the procedure printed out that you would get in the service manual uh, if you, when you originally would go to work on these back in the day, when these things were modern. And there's a couple of reasons why this is a little bit more unique to align than just a regular AM receiver. So we're all, some of us are familiar with doing like an AM radio where you have the 455 kilohertz uh, IF frequency and then you do your RF for your dial accuracy and so forth. This is kind of similar to that but this is, first of all, it's a dual conversion receiver and it's one of the first, if not the first, commercially built one that was mass produced out there. So by no means is it, <laughs> you know, cutting edge technology today, but in its day it was. And what that means is that it has actually two intermediate frequencies. It has the, the traditional 455 kilohertz, but it also has a 2.05 megahertz IF. And that's for bands uh, three, four, and five. So for bands one and two, I believe it is, uh, it only uses the, the, the single conversion, which is the 455 kilohertz. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, it may be a good idea to go onto Wikipedia and look up super heterodyne radio. And it'll talk a little bit about what an intermediate frequency is, what a mixer oscillator is, and all those things. It'll at least give you a basic understanding of what it is. There's lots and lots and lots of videos out there uh, that explain it and probably will do a better job than I would. But anyway, what we really want to talk about here is not the basic, you know, peaking the coils. Everybody does that on a million videos. I want to talk about the more unique part of this, and that is this crystal filter. This is something that is very confusing. The When you read this, it's very, very hard to understand what they're trying to say. I'll read this to you here a little bit. First of all, the procedure. Step two, just the second step in the alignment. They tell you, while turning the slug very slowly in one direction, slowly rock the signal generator. As the adjustment passes through the response of the crystal filter, the output goes through a maximum, then dips down, then starts going up again. The correct setting of this slug is in the center of the observed dip. A swishing note in contrast to the sharp crystal tone will be apparent when the correct adjustment has been reached. Okay, now remember this is designed for people who didn't have very advanced test equipment at the time. You were kind of limited to, you know, to what, what you do, you know, to how you can do this based on what kind of test equipment you had. So if you look here, there's a note. And it says the crystal filter IF transformer secondary winding, which is adjustment U, and that happens to be, so here's the knobs on the front, there's the power transformer, it's right here. This adjustment, they're saying that it's carefully adjusted at the factory to the frequency of the crystal. Now, one thing you need to remember about these is these receivers are 50, 60, 70 years old now, some of them. And any of these halocrafters with this crystal filter, that crystal could have changed its frequency 
a little bit because of moisture in grass or any number of things. So it may not be the same frequency it originally was. Now it says a signal, signal generator which may accurately set to within 0.25 kilohertz of any frequency between 450 and 460 kilohertz. So this should tell you where that crystal frequency is going to be somewhere in that range. Are, is required to make this adjustment. Since the average service signal generator will not meet this requirement, do not attempt. And uh, what they're saying about that is you have to have a very clean sine wave for this particular adjustment so that your uh, measurement equipment <laughs> will be accurate so things won't jump around. I mean, you can get away with, uh, you know, one of the old standard signal generators, but they, you know, the low end ones like that ICO th that uh, we just refurbished and so forth. But it's, it's a little bit difficult. It works, but it's a little bit more difficult. What they're really trying to tell you to do is you set your signal generator at 455 kilohertz. You're going to look at it on the, at the output uh, on your oscilloscope and on your uh, VTVM meter, you know, so you can see the swing of the, of the meter or the bar graph on your, anal on your digital meter, whatever. And you're going to adjust, you're going to adjust this frequency on your signal generator. You know, that you need an analog adjustment. It's really, really hard with a digital signal generator, one of these synthesized ones that does not have a knob. Because you, can't, you have to move the sweep through the frequencies and then when you see that little blip, you, you, you're on top of that frequency and you got to kind of slow down how you turn it. It's really a pain because when you're trying to use a, you know, a digital like the 8657, you're hitting the up and down on the frequency and you move it in steps. If you move it in too slow of steps, it'll take you forever to sweep through it. If you go too fast of a step, you may skip right over it and you'll never get that dip. So, Again, you can do that, but all they're trying to do is find the low point uh, of that peak and the high point of the peak and kind of center it in there. And then you're going to adjust, you're going to peak all the rest of your IF coils based on that low point, if that makes sense. So I'll kind of show you that, um, but I'm not going to do it the, the way this thing tells you, because it's kind of difficult. We're going to use a spectrum analyzer, which is much easier and gives you a much better representation of what they're talking about here, because this is confusing. It took me a long time to kind of understand what they're talking about. But if you look at it on the spectrum analyzer, it all makes sense. So that's how we're going to do it. Now, the way they have you do it, they want you to turn the BFO on, and they want you to create a note. In other words, you'll zero beat it at 455 kilohertz. Then you'll move it about somewhere between 400 hertz and 1 kilohertz off. So you're kind of moving your test point, your, your measurement point, up by you know a kilohertz from that 455. So you're kind of shifting everything above that dip, if that makes sense. And then you're going to peak based on that. And you're, you're actually going off of the output of your speaker terminals. So you're really going by that note that you're creating from the BFO. We're going to take that all out. We're, I have this turned off. And what we're going to do is we're going to directly inject the signal where they tell you in the service manual. And that is they want you to attach to pin 4 of V5. And if we look at V5, V5 is your second IF amp. So you're actually looking at the input of your second IF, which is the output of your first IF. So here's the first IF right here, which is V4, goes through the transformer and then comes out of here into pin 4 of V5. And that's where we're injecting our signal. So we're going to inject a signal right here, and then you see your crystal. And we're going to adjust this coil, this point U, we're going to adjust it over here on this side. And this is where we're going to, uh, 
where we're going to set based on this crystal. Now, here is your FM detector, or at least it goes to your detector from this second transformer here, which is your third IF. And this goes down to this 6AL5, which is nothing but a dual diode tube, and this is your, this is your actual detector circuit. Um, where I'm going to measure it is I'm going to measure it right where it goes into this transformer here. I keep going off camera, sorry. So we're going to come out of V5 or V6 and we're going to look right on pin 8. Now you say to yourself, you don't want to hook your, your test equipment up to high voltage. And you're right, but that's not the way we're going to do this. Number one, I have some protective equipment between the, the spectrum analyzer and this device so that wouldn't be a problem but we really don't want to put anything on here because we don't want to shift the frequency by adding some sort of external thing so we're going to loosely couple this now, how do we do that all right let's take a look if you look I'll see how close I can get without going out of focus if you look very carefully, there's losing focus. Here we go. You can see I have a little piece of tubing over there. And all I did was I took a piece of plastic tubing like this. Okay, this is just a piece of plastic tubing. I cut it off and then I just cut a slit. I just took a knife or scissors and just slit it. And then I slipped it over that bare wire. See the bare wire going from that pin one of the uh, or pin eight of the uh, of this third IF, and it goes right into the transformer. I insulated it with that little piece of plastic tubing, and that's what you're looking at right here. And then I clipped my spectrum analyzer probe right over top of that, so it's really not touching anything. So it's capacitively coupling from that wire onto this. And believe it or not, a spectrum analyzer is not like an oscilloscope. It is really, really sensitive. So I'm also using a spectrum analyzer that has a tracking generator. You can also do this in a spectrum analyzer that does not have a tracking generator and just use your signal generator. You know, but you have to have a sweep signal and you have to you know, sync it to the spectrum analyzer. It's a pain in the butt. So if you have <laughs> A tracking generator makes it a lot easier. So there's the connection. All right, we have our goes into on that second IF. We have a goes outa from the third IF, and we have the crystal phasing crystal right here in the middle. See it? That little black and white sandwich there. That's what that is. I am currently set. And this is where we deviate greatly from the service manual. I don't care about the volume or the speaker output or anything. Okay. And I have the settings here. If I can get my stupid camera to behave. I have this set to normal reception. I'm not using the crystal yet. And you can see with the tracking generator going on. See what the meter is doing as it sweeps, as it goes through the peak and out of the peak. See that? And then it resets and now it starts the sweep again. And now it's going to go back and it'll you'll see a blip. Blip. Now it's sweeping again. And it's sweeping through that IF. Okay. Hope that makes sense. But down here is what you're seeing. And, of course, you're going to get a little bit of uh, shutter roll from the camera. But, essentially, this is what you're seeing. So, this center frequency is 455 kilohertz. This is called your skirt on both sides. And I'm starting, I'm spanning, if we look at the span, it's set to 100 kilohertz. So, it's 405 kilohertz here. And... It sweeps up to 455, and then it goes to 505. So it goes from 405 to 505 kilohertz. And you're seeing 
each one of these graticules you go across, okay, is, you know, however many kilohertz, what is that, uh, one, two, three, four, so it's 10 kilohertz per division. So this represents frequency domain. This represents amplitude up and down. So you can see the amplitude is very low when you get down, you know, get away on either side, get away from that peak frequency of 455. Pretty nice looking little waveform in there, isn't it? So this is what it looks like when you have a normal, like if you hook this up to a normal AM radio, it would look just like that, okay? And what you're seeing is that that transformer that, that you adjust will actually block the frequencies above and below that 455. And it kind of doesn't do it very sharply, but it does it gradually, okay? Now, a really sharp filter, you would see this come across and it would shoot straight up, go across a little bit for its bandwidth, and then bang, right back down. But you can see this actually has a roll off on either side. And that's just a function of how the, how the uh, transformer was built. That, when people talk about the Q factor or the quality factor of a filter, that's what they're talking about. A high quality factor, you'd see this bang right up here and bang right back down. A, the lower the Q, the more of a slope you're going to have and the more f outside frequencies it's going to let in even though they're attenuated somewhat. If that makes sense. All right, so this is normal. This is a normal IF. Now let's switch in that crystal phasing and see what the heck they're talking about here, what it does. See that? Now we get this blip. Now I'm on broad crystal filter now. See what it does to the IF? It puts a notch in there. And see there's a big dip here and then there's a big peak here. All right. Let's exp let's move our span way in. So let's go to 2 kilohertz span. So now you're going from Hold on, let's go to 5 kilohertz. And you see what you have right now? You have this little blip here, and then this comes up, and it's kind of not real, <laughs> not real well defined. And then you have your peak at 455, and then she roll, it rolls off. And you can see since we're we we're looking at such a small frequency range, we're only looking from like. 452.5 to 457.5, you know, for the whole width of the screen here now. So what effect is it going to have? We're going to adjust T9, the secondary. What is it that this is going to affect when we adjust it? That's the big thing. How is it going to affect that waveform and what's it going to do to it? All right. I am now going to rotate that adjustment that they want and we're going to move it off of where it is now and let's just go I'm going counterclockwise and see what's happening as I'm turning it I'm getting a more defined peak on both sides and this slope here is starting to flatten out a little bit okay And there you go. Okay, when it's all said and done, this is what, it, what you should have. And what you're looking at right now is we are set to the sharp crystal phasing setting on the reception knob. And this is the way they want you to line it up. So what we're doing is, as I showed you earlier, we want to adjust it until we get a nice straight slope here. And see this peak up here where, where we are, if you notice, it's off a little bit. Instead of being right at four, 455 kilohertz, it's actually at 455.53. So it's a little bit above. And that is the crystal frequency. That is the resonant frequency of the crystal. 
What they were trying to explain in the instructions, in a very confusing way, at least to me it was very confusing, is they, were, they had you go to 455 kilohertz right on, which is your IF frequency. Then they want you to turn on the BFO, or the beat frequency oscillator, and they want you to zero beat that at the 455. Then they want you to turn it up and make like a one kilohertz, somewhere between 400 hertz and a one kilohertz tone. So what that's doing is that's kind of moving the audio portion of this like down here somewhere. And then they have you adjust your signal generator to that frequency, wherever, wherever it ended being, you know, when you were rocking it back and forth and you were finding that little peak, wherever you ended up getting that tone at, that was the frequency which you were going to set your IF. And then what you were going to do is at that particular frequency, you were going to adjust, you know, peak all of your, your IF transformers for maximum output. When you're done, what you're going to find is that you're going to have two different peaks in this thing. With crystal phasing, it's going to be peaked at this right here, and when you're in the normal operating mode or normal receive mode, you'll see that the, the, the actual IF will be shifted off of there a little bit. So here's the sharp, here's broad, and you can see this, the frequency is the same, but it just has a little more of a curve to it, and this part here is a little bit wider. These are called your skirts, as we were talking about. And then if we go to the normal IF, let's wait till it sweeps through. You can see that your IF is shifted back ever so slightly. So it's going to be back somewhere, peaked somewhere around in here someplace. It's not going to be right on 455 or, or whatever. It's going to be off a little bit. And that's just the way these things work but it's not enough frequency to make a difference. I mean, you still have enough bandwidth here that it's going to receive just fine. So back to the sharp setting. And that's what we want. Okay. So at this point, we are going to use that frequency, which is 455.45, as our uh, test frequency. And before we do that, we're going to have to remove the signal generator, or the tracking generator in this case, and we're going to have to move it back to the, to this, to the uh, tuning gang. And we're going to inject our signal before the IF. Okay, we're connected back up to the tuning gang. And again, we have our signal generator set to 455.45 kilohertz. Now, if we wanted to, we could still do this with the tracking generator, but I'm not. I'm going to do it the, nor the, the way that the book says, but we're also going to look at the peak on the spectrum analyzer because we're still monitoring it. We still have it connected. So. For starters, let's look at our meter that has a bunch of wires in front of it. I have to move some of that out of the way so you can see a little better. All right, now to make this a little bit easier, the meter will really bounce around if you put a weak signal in this. But you have to have a weak signal in this or you're going to be fighting with the AVC circuit. So to get around that, I just pulled out the 6H6 tube. Okay, I don't know if it's going to focus or not, but there's the 6H6. And what is the 6H6, you might ask? Well, it serves two functions. It's a dual diode. And looking over here, here's the 6H6. And you can see one part in here is your noise limiting circuit, which we don't need that. We have it switched out anyway. The other one controls the AVC. So if you remove this, you take the AVC out altogether. That's going to make sure that we don't 
have any, we're not fighting against that. It doesn't say that in the book, it's just something that I found that makes it a little easier. All right, so what we want to do is we want to go through, and I have a feeling these are all going to be pretty much spot on. And we're going to adjust V, W, X, Y, Z, 1, and 2. <laughs> so looking on the chart, V is right here. You can see V, and then you have W, and you have X, and then you have Y right there, and then you have Z, which is going to be right here, this top coil. And then you have number one, which is this capacitor. And you have number two, which is the top of this coil. And, uh, that, and then the bottom of this coil, we're going to get to later here. But that's it. So let's start with V, as in Victor. And I'm just going to turn the adjustment. I don't think it's going to be out. Uh, that's going down. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess it, it was out a little bit. Okay, let's go to the next one. Let's do W, which is right up here. It's the other side of that coil. If I can get the adjuster on there. Yeah, that one's right on. W. And then X, which is underneath. It's the next one over. See what it does. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, let me set the range a little bit more. Yeah, it was just a little bit. Not much. Barely anything at all. Right there's about it. Okay. Y is the other side of that coil. Let's see here. I don't know if I'm interfering or not. Kind of hard to reach around everything. Wrong way. Oh, yeah. Got a little more out of that one. Okay, there's... Y, and then Z, which is this coil right here, if I can get on it. Oh, wow, that one got some. So, yeah, they're a little bit out. Z. And... one and two. So number one is that little trimmer capacitor. I don't think that's going to make a big difference. I don't know, maybe. Whoop. Let's see if I can get a different adjustment tool here. The little screw is kind of slippery on that. I'm going to just leave that one as is because I don't think yeah I'm going to leave that one alone and number two is the top of this other coil and I got a little bit out of that one too didn't we Okay. Very good. All right, that's all done. It's as simple as that. The IF is pretty much finished. Now, the only thing left to do is the... where it says NBFM. What does NBFM stand for? Well, right there. That is narrow band frequency modulation. We'll take a look at that next, 
but real quick let me also show you where we are on the spectrum analyzer and if you look <laughs> we're clear almost off the charts now if you remember that peak was down here someplace when we started and now look how high it is and the nice thing is when you look at the skirts all of the noise band is equally distributed between the two I think this is uh, I can tell you this receiver is going to perform very very well okay for this alignment we're going to keep everything connected except we're going to increase our amplitude of our signal to one millivolt or a thousand microvolts all right so we're really going to drive a very hard signal into this okay and there's no modulation now that you turn the modulation off and you're going to need to make a little test jig that basically consists of two one mega ohm resistors with one end of them twisted together if you can see that so that's all we have and I'm going to take one end of the resistors let's see if I can get this around here where we can see it better back you out I'm going to take one end of the resistors and I'm going to clip a little clip lead onto it and I'm going to clip it to ground which I'm just going to use this little ground terminal here this other one I am going to clip the other end like this and I'm going to clip it onto this little junction up here and this is right where the uh, now it shows you right here right where that one microfarad capacitor is connected you're gonna hook it right there in the two the junction of that one microfarad and the 220 K then we're going to take one side of our voltmeter and we're going to connect the positive of our voltmeter to this little junction here where these two uh, well, let's, let's see if I can show it to you C34 and R29 my bad I had to look it back up right there we're going to connect it okay and that's where we are up here you can see it right there and then we're going to take the other lead the negative lead of our meter and we're going to connect it to where they where our little resistors are connected together okay then we're going to turn our meter on to millivolts or not and I have something connected wrong and then of course you have to set the thing onto that mode <laughs> I'm still on crystal okay now we're on narrow band FM all right and they want us to set the band switch on to let's see same as step one so we want band number two once again which band number two and with the correct switch the position selected you should have zero volts there should be a null there and you can see it's way off and that makes sense because when we tested this earlier I noticed that uh, in narrowband FM mode it was not it was distorting the sound it, it would you could never tune right into it all right so let's rotate the adjustment and it's number three so if you remember we finished up with the top of that one can here which is Z now we're gonna go or number two I mean well now we're gonna go on the opposite side of this underneath which is this one right here number three and we're going to adjust that till we get a zero volts right there okay and this is actually for your narrow band FM so let's rotate this and see am I going the right way yeah 
I hope this will adjust. And it's real touchy once you get close to it. That was a lot of voltage that it was off by, but I only rotated this about one turn. And the idea is we want this to sit at null point, which is zero volts. And it should kind of bounce between positive voltage and negative voltage. And you can see how difficult it is to adjust. That's about it right there. Once it settles, I'll adjust it again, and I'll just keep going until I have it right at close to zero volts as I can. And that should give us our null point. So I'll be right back. Okay, that's about as close as I can get it. And it just kind of bounces around there. I mean, we're within one millivolt or two millivolts. That's going to be just fine. A far cry from how far it was. All right, I think we're good. Okay, in case some of you are wondering what narrowband FM is, it's a little bit, it's a lot different. <laughs> well, I'll say it's a little bit different in some ways and a lot different in others than standard FM that we're used to, broadcast FM. First of all, it was never designed for high fidelity. Second of all, it was popular 1940s, 1950s era. It was used a lot in mobile communications and it's definitely a mode that's used for voice communications. It's not something you're gonna play music on and you'll see why in a second. But I have it set right now to NB mode and I have the speaker connected and I have the oscilloscope connected across the speaker terminals. And if I turn the volume up, you can see that I can tune in and get a pretty decent looking sine wave there. Not too bad at 400 hertz. Now here's the problem. I'm going to turn this down so it doesn't annoy us. If you look, I'm transmitting at 16 megahertz because I'm on band number four. And if you look, I have the deviation set to one kilohertz, which is as low as my uh, 8657 can go when it comes to deviation. The maximum deviate, the maximum modulation that you're going to get on this old mode, which is this old uh, narrow band FM, is 5 kilohertz. And you're going to see with this really old unit, you're really not going to get 5 kilohertz on this very well. I'll show you what happens when you go up in your bandwidth, okay? So we're at 1 kilohertz right now. And you can see it kind of jumps around and kind of falls off of station and so forth. There we go, we're back on. Now watch what happened. I'm going to go up to 2 kilohertz. <laughs> and you see what happens right away. And I can bring it back in. Okay, and it gets louder, of course. I can go up to 3 kilohertz. And again, now I can't tune it. See? There's way too much modulation. So at 3 kilohertz, we're already over modulating the signal. Okay, if that makes sense. I go back down to 2. It cleans up pretty good. Right? A little bit pointy at the bottom of the waveforms, but part of that is because there's a capacitor that they put directly across the output transformer on purpose. So here's your output transformer to your speakers and you see there's this capacitor. It's 10 nanofarad right across that. And the purpose of that is to cut the high frequency. So you're going to get distortion 
Um, and the higher you go in frequency, the more distorted that'll get because of that, or the more attenuated it'll get. All right, let's turn that noise off. So as you can see, this is really meant to be just a rudimentary communications mode, and it is FM, so it is frequency modulation, and it was very popular until single sideband took over, and pretty much they dropped this whole thing. Now, they still used it in like police and you know emergency vehicles and things because it was a clearer sound, and it also, with the FM modulation, the signal strength is a little bit stronger than with AM modulation. So you got, basically you got more distance out of, your, out of the radio system that they were using. So I hope that answers a little bit what that is. But it, it works on this. Uh, it's just you're never, you're probably not going to find very much that's being broadcast in this mode. They have, a, have newer modes called Super Narrow Band or SNB. And those go down to 2.5 kilohertz bandwidth, but again, different. I think they're different. <laughs> I don't work with those modes. I don't mess around too much with that. So there's, I know there's a lot of Elmers out there that know way more about those modes than I do, especially the ones that were around in those days, and actually worked those modes, or worked on that sort of thing. I know my cousin worked on a lot of the uh, commercial band radio receivers and transmitters and so forth for uh, you know for emergency and for you know service communications and things like that he worked on the radios and I'm sure he worked with this a little bit I'll have to ask him about it next time I talk to him anyway it works and we saw it and there's a demonstration so we're gonna do one last test or one last yeah test or alignment and that is we're now going to do the second IF frequency which is the 2.5 megahertz or 2.075 megahertz if and this is for bands i think what is it bands three four and five so on this procedure they want you to go on band four so we'll switch it over to band four uh, we'll connect everything up again and they want a 2.075 modulated signal and they want you to read you know at the speaker and peek it out uh, using the meter so we'll do that and we're just going to feed 2.5 megahertz this time or 2.075 megahertz so let me get set up for that all right we're set to 2.075 megahertz i have 15 millivolts which is a really strong signal going into this thing and i have a whole lot of <laughs> modulation and at the output with the volume all the way up, I'm, I mean, it's millivolts. It's not good. So I don't know if I have something connected wrong. I read the instructions multiple times, but it just doesn't look right. Um, they want us to adjust positions, uh, slugs four, five, and six, which is number four is right there. And number five is this one down here and number six is the top side of that same one up here so let's try number four so i'm going to adjust that and that's right in here if i can get on it it's so like i said it seemed to be working on these upper channels or on the, these upper bands so I, I tend to think maybe it's me but Let's get the scope on there and see. Oh. Whoa. Okay, and I've just pegged my voltmeter over here. Okay. Obviously, that was way out of alignment. So let me take my... Okay, now I'm down into the 4 millivolt range. Let's see what happens here. There it goes again. Wow. Turn it down. Whoop. Wait a second, I hit the wrong button. Okay. Let's take the amplitude down. 
Now I'm down to 400 microvolts. Okay, so right there, I got to go up a little bit in amplitude. There's the peak. And let's go over to our meter here. And let's see if we can get this meter to peak. Go down a little bit. There we go. Whoop. And right there's the peak. Wow, that was off by a country mile. Okay, now my question is, what do the other ones look like now? So we'll do five and six. Number five is this one right up here. I don't know if you can see it, but it's right up here in my blurry camera. Let's get on there. That was way off. Okay, let's... Oh boy. I got some more out of that one yet. Okay, let's go on the top side. Let's see what it looks like. Oh boy, I got even more out of it. Let's drop the amplitude down again. And let's get on this and see if we can get some more out of it. Well, that was not it. That one was pretty much on. So we got a little bit out of them. But that first one was way, way off. So there you go. And it's jumping around now because I have the, the amplitude of the signal generator way down now. Let's see if I can go to 250 microvolts in there. Yeah, okay. Much better. Okay. Wow. That was a big, big change. So that one slug was out by a good bit. This bottom one here. Okay, it is working, but here's the thing, we have an S9 signal there now, and I cleaned that pot and adjusted this, and this is a local AM station, and I mean, I'm clear up to three, and it's barely, you know, talking volume, usually it's a lot louder than that. So, I think we still have a problem, and I think it's with the AVC circuit. It seems to be too, I don't know. Let's pull that 6H6 tube back out. That's just what I thought. Now it's driving it way into distortion, which it should. It should, because this is a really strong station. But I think this uh, AVC circuit is not working properly. It seems to be over overreacting. So I don't think the tube is bad. I think there's something else wrong. So let's take a look and see on the schematic what we can find. So looking at the schematic, let me get a pointer out. Here's our AVC circuit right here, coming through here. It comes through this capacitor, which we have replaced. And then we have these two resistors here with this capacitor, which that's been replaced. It comes through the plate, and then it finds ground through this little divider circuit right here. So let's check these resistors and let's check these resistors. So first one are the resistors that are on pin 5. So let's go up here and give you a 
little better view. And I'm going to connect, let's see, from pin five, one, two, three, four, five. And there is a, looks to be, there's a 400, well, no, yeah, 470K, which is this one. And you can see it is reading 570K almost. So that one's off. That might be our problem. And then there's a one meg resistor, which is one of these cylindrical type dog bone resistors. See it right there? And I'm sorry, that's not it. That's a capacitor. Here it is, one meg. And that's one meg. So that one's good. That's not bad. So this 470K right here is bad. Now there's also on the cathode, which is pin eight, we have right here, we have the 180K and the 27K. So let's see what those look like. And those are going to be pin eight is right here. And there's a wire coming off of it. It goes, here's the 27K, so let's connect to that, and that's going to ground, and that's high. Our 27K is 39K, and then coming from the line, we have this dog bone resistor, which is the 180K, and it is because it has, if you look on it, the body is brown, that's one. The end is gray, which is eight. And the dot, BED, remember this is a bed resistor, is yellow, meaning four zeros. So that's 180K. All right. And that resistor's reading open. Look at that. Open resistor. open resistor. Well, we have resistors to replace. That's probably explains why the AVC circuit is overreacting. I can't believe it, but I actually have a new old stock 27K carbon comp resistor and it's reading perfectly. And just so you can see, <laughs> This uh, 180K dog bone resistor is really, it's shot. And there it is. No good. Uh, and again, I know I mentioned the bed thing. The way you read the value of these is just remember the word bed, B-E-D, body. So the color of the body, which is brown on this one. Brown is one. And and you can see the end has paint on it, and that is gray paint. So gray is eight, so one eight. And the multiplier is the dot that's in the middle, B E D. The dot is yellow, which is four, so there's four zeros. So this is 180K. And we're just going to replace it with just a regular old 180K. All right, let me get those in there. Okay, our three resistors, one, two, three, are replaced. I turned the receiver on now, give it a second to warm up. And let's look at our volume control now to see how loud it gets. So, you can hear just <laughs> barely turn it up and you have all kinds of volume now. So that fixed that. So this thing should even be more sensitive now than it was, which is amazing. Okay, as you can see, I found a couple other resistors that were out of tolerance, but none of them like that, <laughs> like those other two. So I replaced them. Better safe than sorry. Uh, these were all right kind of on the edge of being out of tolerance or just barely out of tolerance so 
and just as simple as that I turn it on I move the dial the tiniest little bit and we're on band four nice strong signal I'm only on volume number three pretty cool awesome so this last part of the calibration is the most tedious but it also is one of the easier parts it has a lot of calibration points if you look right here this chart shows you and the purpose of this last calibration is to set the dial accuracy so that whatever frequency you're trying to tune to <laughs> is actually the frequency it's indicating on the the front dial so there's you basically are going to align a coil and a capacitor and one one of the components has a higher influence on the higher part of the dial scale and the other one has more influence on the lower part of the dial scale and the idea is once you get those two frequencies balanced then it should track all the way across so that's what you're doing and what you're gonna find is one adjustment will throw the other one off so you'll do the first alignment and then you'll do the second alignment to bring that end of the scale in and it'll throw the first one off ever so slightly and you have to kind of go back and forth back and forth till you get it I'm going to do one band with you I'll do step one because steps two three four and five are the same idea only just the different bands and you're using you're setting your signal generator to different frequencies now I am going to once again deviate a little bit from the service manual instead of looking at the output across the speaker and having to rely on the amplifier and so forth which could pick up noise or whatever I actually have the meter I took it out from the bench and I moved it in front so we can see it I have it connected to AC volts and I have it if we zoom up here we can look I have it connected to the AVC line so if you look at that resistor that we just replaced remember those two resistors that is the junction of those two resistors which is on the 6H6 tube which happens to be right here if I back you up enough uh, let's see let me get this down where we can see it so if I go right here these junction of these two resistors R63 and R36 and those are the two resistors we replaced because they were out of tolerance and it's connected to pin 8 of the 6H6 uh, tube and that's your AVC line that's a lot better place and you don't have to listen to the amplifier or turn the volume up and worry about noise or anything that's a really good stable place to do this now some of you are going to come out and say why didn't you do that in the first place well, remember I'm doing this video so that you can see different methods of doing things so I'm going to demonstrate a couple different ways now, earlier we looked at looking at the speaker output another way we looked at was using the spectrum analyzer and actually looking at the high frequency uh, coming out of the transformers when we peak them all of those are valid methods and they all work pretty much equally well the reason I'm showing you all of these is number one this radio is very friendly to you using all of those methods and second of all other radios you might work on may not be as easy to to get to for those different things so this shows you different ways of doing this, of doing the same thing so that you have a better idea of the concept of what you're doing when you're aligning these so anyway we're looking at the AVC line now again you don't want a real strong signal uh, you just want enough to deflect the meter and we're gonna keep that in in view here and we're gonna look at what they want you to set up first of all okay we verified that we have all these settings what they want right here is they want and I'm reading down this this down here you want volume tone and sensitivity fully clockwise now because we're looking at the AVC line 
our volume control does not have to be up at maximum. It actually doesn't really matter. So you're just driving a lot of signal into the dummy load <laughs> for no reason. Um, if you want to crank it up, go right ahead, but it's, it's not going to make any difference on where we're testing it. Sensitivity, of course, you want that up. You want to turn the BFO off. You want your crystal phasing knob set to zero. You want your noise limiter and so set to off. Your reception switch, you just want normal IF, so you don't want your crystal phasing selected for this particular alignment. And of course, BFO turned off. They said that twice. <laughs> and that's it. So we have all those settings. And the main thing is what's really important is where you put the frequency, the signal generator, where you tune the main tuning dial, and where the band spread is set. If you notice, the band spread is set at, a, at 100 all the time, okay? That means the band spreads all the way to the, to the right, and I'll show you what that looks like, because this, that's really important. It'll throw off this setting severely if you don't have that set properly. Okay, the dial on your right here is your band spread dial. And I did a little video on what band spread is, so you might want to go back and check that out if you're not sure what band spread is. But what we're going to do is we're going to set this knob, and it even says the word set, okay, right on 100. If it is not set there, then when you look at the main dial scale up here, these frequencies are not going to be correct, okay? Again, you're not sure what band spread is or what it does, look it up. I have a video on it, and there's plenty of other articles online that you can look up that will explain what that is. All right, so our first thing we're going to adjust is band number one, and that's our AM broadcast band, okay? That's the first one we're going to start out. You always start at the lowest frequency, and you work your way up to the highest. That's just the way they have you typically do it when you do these radio alignments. Not just Halicrafters, but most, most of the radios out there. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do 1.5 megahertz, or 1,500 kilohertz. All right. Get my pointer again. Feel free to skip ahead if you guys know all this stuff already. 1500 kilohertz, band 1, which we selected, band spread at 100, and of course the main tuning dial is at 1.5 megahertz or 1500 kilohertz. So let's go up to our signal generator, and of course they want a modulated signal, and they're not, I don't think, yeah, it does say mod. <laughs> mod for modulated. So we have our modulation set to AM. We're going to go to frequency 1.5 megahertz. And you want to turn this up just until a signal is heard. See that? They don't you don't you don't want to crank it is what I'm saying. So First thing we're going to do is I have 316 microvolts set and we're going to the antenna input. Okay. Connecting the test equipment, we I did skip over this part. You want to connect your signal generator to A1 through a 330 ohm carbon resistor. Okay. And then you want the A2 and ground need to be jumpered together and you want to keep the output of the signal generator as low as possible at all times to prevent overloading of the high gain stages. All right, so just enough output to give you a usable indication on your meter. So I have my meter set to my lowest AC scale which is only 4 volts. Okay. Okay, I do not have a 300 ohm carbon resistor, but I have a 330 ohm, and that'll be just fine. Why do they want a carbon resistor? Okay, I've, I've mentioned this many times in the past. 
The main reason they want a carbon resistor is back when this was written, the other resistors that you had were wire wound resistors. And a wire wound resistor had inductance. It had a considerable amount of inductance at very high frequencies. When you started getting up into the higher HF bands, that would actually act as an inductor and it would affect your signal. Now, a lot of the modern resistors we have, you know, like some of the carbon film and the, uh, especially the metal oxide, they may have some little, and even the metal film, they may have a spiral pattern cut in them and they will affect really high frequencies when you get up into VHF and so forth and higher. But for this particular application, it would be negligible and it would be okay to use. So long story short, on these radios, at this band, if you used a, a carbon film resistor, it would probably work just fine. I don't think you'd have any problems at all. So let's tune in and let's see if uh, we're going to set this to 1.5 megahertz. First thing I do though is I go and I find the station. So I'll go up to the top of the dial here and as I tune through I should hit it and there it is. See it? See how the meter's moving as I'm tuning? So right now it is just a little bit above 1.5 megahertz. Okay? But we know that the receiver is working. It's just off a little tiny bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this dial very accurately to 1.5 megahertz. Okay. So if I can bend over here and look. And I'm trying to look at, at a straight, you know, kind of a straight line of sight. So I know I'm right on top of it. And now what we're going to do is we're going to adjust adjustment A. And you want to use a plastic or ceramic alignment tool uh, in order to do this because these capacitors, the screw terminal on them is live and also your any metal object can throw off the alignment when the, ob the metal object is in there. So there's multiple reasons. You want to use non-conductive and non-magnetic, non-ferrous uh, devices. All right, or adjustment tools. So let's go here and this is a capacitor. We're going to get on this. We're going to adjust it until we get a signal. That's what we're going to do. Okay, Let's see which way. And of course, Tony always goes the wrong way at first. And I'm not finding it. That's not good. Not good at all. So how far off are we? Oh, we were off a little bit. It was more than one turn. Okay, so let's keep going. And right there, see how it peaked? If I keep turning, it'll start dropping again. So I'm going to go back the other way. And that's it. Now, one thing you may want to remember. When you're making these adjustments on these trimmer capacitors, most of these trimmer capacitors use a, their compression type, meaning there's two metal plates with a piece of mica in between them, and turning that adjustment screw squeezes them together or unsqueezes them when you loosen. Well, the problem with that is when you're using these alignment tools, if you're pushing in and you're putting force forward on that screw, you're actually adding compression to that plate, and you'll get it aligned perfectly, and as soon as you take your hand away and you take that pressure away you were holding on there, the alignment will drop. So you have to make sure when you're rotating this screw you're not pushing in on it as you're turning. Okay? So right like that, I'm not even pushing on the screw. And there we go. When we take our hand away, that, and you can see if I push on this, and it's not moving too much on this one, some of them if you push on them, it will do that. Okay, now they want you to adjust position B, 
and then position C. So you're going to do this one, this one, and this one. And I took a red paint marker and I marked all of these so I don't have to keep going back to the service manual to find out where these all are. And this red paint marker is alcohol soluble so if somebody decides they don't want to see these ugly letters we can easily wipe them off with alcohol. All right, A, B, and C. Okay, got a little bit out of that one. And then C. Okay. And then you just go back and they want you to do it over again. And uh, we're going to, first of all, we're going to now go to 600 kilohertz. All right, so frequency 600 kilohertz. And we're going to do the same thing. We're now going to move all the way down to 600 kilohertz and set it very accurately on our dial. And it's a little bit above, so I'm going to put it right on 600 kilohertz. And then we're going to adjust D, the letter D which is this one up here, to bring it in. We'll see which way I have to go with it. And I'm re I got the camera on my chest right now. <laughs> oh, I popped right through it. Okay. And again, I'm trying not to, I'm using two hands so I don't have to push forward to hold this, the thing in this adjustment. Okay, that looks pretty close. Let me go just a... I want to kind of pass through it and see... yep. So let's come back now. And that's about it right there. Now they want you to go back to the 1.5 megahertz frequency 1.5 megahertz and they want you to go back to the dial position on that and don't be surprised if it's off ever so slightly because that one drags it off and we're going to do a b and c again and you can see it's off i'm right on that 1.5 megahertz where i was before and it's just not there. So now we have to do A, B, and C again. And this is what happens. You have to go back and forth a couple of times. When I said it's tedious, that's what I was, that's what I meant. And this is going to throw the other one off now, again. A, B, that one was pretty spot on. And that was just a hair off. There we go. Now they want you to go back and do D again and then A, B, and C one final time. Okay? I'm going to do that off camera, but you get the picture of what we're doing. All of the bands are going to have to be done that way. And that's why I said it's a little bit tedious, but nothing difficult is there. So let me go and get the dial accuracy done and this last calibration and we'll come back and wrap things up. Okay, the last adjustment of the highest band has been done at 54 megahertz. And everything looks perfect. Uh, they were not, they were pretty close. I mean, there, like I said, the, we, there was a wee little bit of dial inaccuracy when this thing first came in here, but I knew it wasn't terrible. And sure enough, we didn't have to touch those adjustments a whole lot to get them to come in couple more notes. Number one, this metal shield is very important. Do not remove it when doing this alignment. Even if it's harder to get the tool in there to adjust it, leave this cover on. Now with this particular radio, if you don't have it, if it's out of the case, it really doesn't make much if any difference at all on the alignment. The case itself has holes drilled in it that line up with these holes when you have it mounted in the case. So you don't even have to take this thing out of the case
to do the dial accuracy adjustment. But the reason they put this sub cover on here is so that after you do the IF and everything, you don't have to keep taking it in and out of the case. The metal here, which is connected to ground or to chassis, actually acts, it will capacitively couple to some degree to all of these coils and capacitors in here. And it will throw off your alignment. If I take this cover off right now, this alignment will go out. So it's important that you have it like that. Okay, that's another thing. Last but not least, I put some notes in this video about the measurement points uh, for, for those skirts. Remember we were talking about, we were looking at the peak. We were looking at either side of the peak. We called those the skirts. And we were talking about the, the usable area of the signal. And sure enough, at the bottom of this, they actually were nice enough to put this in there. So they can show, they show you that your usable part of the signal is 6 dB, or basically half of the signal or quarter of the signal down from where, uh, from your peak. So that portion of the signal is the usable area. The silence, radio silence, or the low noise floor, they consider to be 60 dB down, okay? And that's what they're talking about. And they're showing your 6 dB point and your 60 dB point, how far they should be uh, off of your 455 kilohertz. So you can actually look at those. If we wanted to look at those skirts and, you know, from the peak and measure the 6 dB down point, it should be about 6 kilohertz up and six kilohertz down <laughs> from that 455. And you should have 60 dB down when you get to about 15 kilohertz away from this 455, if that makes sense. So this is what they're talking about here. It's all about having a standard way of measuring things to compare to other things, all right? So just some interesting things to look at. Let's get it in the case. Unfortunately, the case really should be, you know, sandblasted and painted, but I don't have the means to do that right now. And I really don't like doing that kind of work in my wood shop because, of course, getting all that kind of dust and things around woodworking is not a good thing. So uh, I'm going to leave that up to the owner. He knows, I'm sure he knows a lot of people, and if he really likes this radio and, and is going to use it a lot, then maybe he may take it to some friends that own a body shop or something like that and can have the case uh, stripped and repainted professionally. And I think this radio would be worth it myself. That surface rust on the top of the chassis really isn't affecting anything at all. And it's not worth tearing everything out to get to it to clean it better. I just put some sealant on it and it should be just fine. This radio is ready to go. So we're going to put it in the case and wrap this video up. Okay, let's check out our handiwork here and see what we get. I'm not a big person of doing long band sweeps. <laughs> I know that's boring, just like the rest of this video, but um, let's try it out. We're on the AM broadcast band. The following program is pre-recorded. The following program's views, claims, or representations may not reflect. <laughs> Play loose, and I, I don't think. We have a uh, we have one that I think is pretty funny. It's edgy, and it might. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. She didn't snicker, she didn't tear her apart. Okay, hurry up that career in New...
editor of this woman's face. Hey, I got it. We got a great... Whether you call it supply chain issues... I think you guys get the point. <laughs> I've only moved from 1.6 to 1.3 megahertz on the AM broadcast band. Full disclosure, to adjust this carrier level, you want to set the meter to zero. And there's that little pot that's on the right or the left rear corner of the uh, receiver. And the idea is you, you're supposed to go to a dead spot on the dial and then set this to zero. I had a hard time finding a dead spot. And it's not nighttime. It's nothing like, I mean, it's daytime and we're, you see how many stations. And I know, you know, I always complain about how bad of reception I get down here in the bottom of a hill on the side of a hill, <laughs> um, kind of in a valley. But uh, I'm connected up to my 43-foot uh, vertical, which really isn't designed for, uh, you know, the uh, medium wave. Um, and I'm not using a tuner on it. It's just direct connected right now. So, and this receiver does not even have antenna tuning like some of the other models of Halicrafters. But that doesn't seem to affect it very much. And if you notice, when I used that crystal phasing, we were able to zero in on a weak station. And that's kind of what it's for. Of course, you lose fidelity and all kinds of things like that, but that's not the purpose of it. I'll do a quick check of one of the other bands just to show you, and then that's it. So we're on band three right now. And if we set this to the dot on band three, we should be able to get the 40 meter band, which doesn't sound, which is right in this range right here, that seven megahertz band. And it starts at the top end of it. So what you do is, if, if I go back, if we start at 100 where it says set, then what this is, is right up here is your 7.3 megahertz, and then it goes all the way down to 7 megahertz. And this is your 40 meter band. All right. So if I turn this up and I start going back. All we're going to hear is going to be sideband. Uh, can't get on fast enough. You got to be quick. And you can hear the guy answering him. He's obviously further away than the one we were just listening to. And you can see with that crystal phasing and the BFO, you can somewhat decode sideband, but it's difficult. There it is. So, for those of you who are skeptics, you can decode sideband with these radios, and that's a combination of the crystal phasing adjustment and using the BFO. And you can get onto the upper or the lower sideband and decode that. It's difficult. And you can't always do it. But, and, it, and with frequency drift and so forth, with the vacuum tubes and all that, you can definitely have to <laughs> stay after it, you know. With, but you can follow it. 
But you can you can understand what they're saying. You can copy them. So, to me, this is fun. I mean, this isn't much challenge, you know, on a modern communications receiver, especially the you know some of the synthesized and the and the even the and the software controlled ones. I mean, to the point where you just put it on the station, you hit upper sideband, bang, and you can hear them perfectly, um, which is cool. I mean, if your main thing is to communicate with others that's you know that's part of this uh, hobby but I really like sometimes d doing it the old way and seeing if I can get it to work and these these old receivers communications receivers like these and the Hammerlands the Nationals and the Collins they're just fascinating to me so I hope you enjoyed this video it's super duper long and uh, you know the five people that come on 30 seconds after I post a video and hit the dislike, I'm sure they'll really be on top of it quickly this time. Uh, but that's okay. We can't please everyone. Um, and I appreciate everybody that, that offers any opinion, you know, so we know uh, where we stand with things. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope if any of you are into doing alignments on these things, you picked up a couple of things. My methods are not the only methods. They're not always the best either. I'm sure there's others who do this more often who are much have much better methods for things. But this is what works for me, and I was happy to share it with all of you. So this is going to be the last video probably of this year, because we're getting real close to the new year. And uh, we have our last minute jobs we have to finish at work. So I'll probably be tied up on that the rest of the week until the New Year's. So until then, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health. And I really wish you all a very blessed and prosperous New Year. I, I hope that uh, things go better for all of us anywhere we are in the world. Uh, we're all people. We're all God's children. And uh, hopefully we can work together and get through all these difficult times and go back to having a good year next year. That's what I'm hoping for. Anyway, I'll be fixing the radios <laughs> and uh, posting the videos as I can. And uh, I wish you all the best. Take care and Happy New Year, everyone. Bye-bye.